Okay, my name's Kimberly Cook. I'm his wife, and um, I also, in my in my spare time, um, I Make work. It sounds like being my wife is like a full time job. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, so I work as the assistant director of the of the Hendrick Center, which is a leadership center at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I am also a PhD student there in the theological studies, the Sunday Seminary. And if everybody wants to pray for me, I have comprehensive exams in about a week and a half. So (laughs) please pray. Um, But I am thrilled to be here. I have long wanted to be able to invest some of the work that I've done in theology into this church. And so I am just so honored that you are willing um, to come and to learn both from Travis and I. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah. Hey, my name's Travis. Um, I'm a pastor at a local church that you may be familiar with. Um, glad that you guys are here. Uh, we have uh, loved teaching together. Uh, it's something we've always wanted to do more of, and we just haven't gotten a chance uh, as much. And so this is this is a little bit new for us. Uh, so we're we're like a we're like a football team on on week one. We we might be have some stop starts, a few penalties, uh, and then and then we'll get going by by, by maybe week two or three. But uh, I'm really grateful for all of you being here, and, and this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be very interactive, I think. You're welcome to ask questions, interact with us. Uh, this isn't supposed to be just a lecture. Um, it's, it's supposed to be an uh, opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, great. What else? All right. Um, you can sit down if you want to. Uh, Don't <laughs> I'm going to um, just do a couple housekeeping things, and then we will uh, pray and dive into, like, the meat, which is hopefully what y'all are here for. But just a few housekeeping items. Uh, today is the first day of a four-week series uh, on the Trinity, which hopefully you guys have seen through all the marketing and everything. We will be talking about God the Father today, and next week is God the Son, the week after will be God the Holy Spirit, and then the fourth week is about the Godhead And that's when we get into the heresies and all the things we should and shouldn't say about the interaction amongst the Trinity. So just that's where we're headed. Uh, So today we'll be talking about God the Father. We'll be talking about what God does, what what God is like, and who is God. And so I'm going to be talking about what God does. Don't worry, I'll reiterate that several times. Um, One other quick note about this these couple special series, actually we're we're doing the Trinity for this four week run and then we'll have another run um, of four weeks talking about eschatology. So if that's something, the end times, the end of all things, that kind of thing, if that's something you've always wondered about or wanted to dig into, we'll be talking about that too. But this uh, effort actually arises out of an existing connect group called uh, a class called Seeking Understanding. And it's called that because theology uh, throughout church history has often been said to be faith-seeking understanding. So the next eight weeks are going to be a larger effort and just a fun Sunday seminary effort. But if you are looking for a connect group or you do really just enjoy digging into this, it will be leading into a long a long-term connect group that is already going on. So some of those members are here, and if you're interested, please let me know because I'd love to talk to you more about that. So that being said, let's pray, and we will dig in. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time um, and for the privilege that we have to meet together and to think about you and to learn about you and to just recognize um, how you have revealed yourself to us in the world and through your son and through scripture, Lord, you have made yourself known and we, we count that as a privilege to be recipients of that revelation, Lord. And we just ask that you would take this time. I ask that you would take my voice and Travis's voice and um, our learning and our preparation and that you would take everybody's hearts in here, Lord, and that we can just dwell on you and dwell on things that are true. I ask that what we say is true and that it would be glorifying to you and that it would result in worship of you and the building up of this specific church. In your name, amen. All right, so a couple um, first big word, that's sort of big word, a couple presuppositions headed into our conversation about uh, what God does. So I'm going to be covering what God does 
because I have comps coming up, Travis actually has the other two. <laughs> so he's going to be talking about what God is like and who he is. But um, a couple of presuppositions, though. One, we are talking about God the Father in a little under in an hour. So this is not going to be comp- like exhaustive and comprehensive. <laughs> so if we miss something that you're interested in or, you know, that you're like, this is a really important part, you're welcome to bring it up during the questions or come talk to us afterward. But please, you know, recognize church history has been trying to do this for thousands and thousands of years. So, yeah. The book? Oh, Feinberg? Oh. Um, okay. Can I get there in a second? Um, the second thing it, well, actually, yeah, you're right. That is a good time. You're right. Um, so we are largely basing our approach out of a, do you know the name of it? No one like him. None like him. Okay, we're largely basing our, our um, presentation out of a book by a man named Feinberg, F-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, and it's called None Like Him. So we will actually have a copy of that next week, and, uh, and we would encourage everybody to please sign in. And if you do, and for those who come for the next four weeks, you will be entered into a drawing where you will get either that book or a couple other books that we highlight. So, but, but just so that you know kind of where we're getting our information, Feinberg, none like him, is largely what, we're, what we've been using. Three other presuppositions real quick. God exists. We are not going to be talking about arguments for the existence of God here. That is a worthwhile conversation. It's a deeply worthwhile conversation, but we just don't have the time to be able to cover that adequately. So we are assuming God's existence. <laughs> we are also assuming his triunity. We will get there on the fourth week with regard to that. But right now, just everything we're saying is coming out of and uh, the triunity of God. The last presupposition is, you even heard it in my prayer, is that God has revealed himself. God is transcendent, beyond, and that means he is beyond anything that we can know. And the only way we know about him is because he has pulled back the veil and graciously condescended to make himself known to us. So everything that we are looking at and that we are talking about is out of an understanding that There is probably a lot that we don't know, but this is the best we can do with what God has revealed about himself. So those are the presuppositions, and we will hop into what God does. There are, probably the easiest way to go about it is to think of God having three major things that he does. And these are major. Obviously, we're talking, again, about God the Father. But um, the three major things or big categories to have in your mind is creation, so he creates. He providentially cares for that creation, and he redeems that creation. So again, because of the time constraints, and because we are good old Baptists, and we talk about salvation and justification and redemption so much, we're not actually going to talk much about redemption today. I'm going to roll redemption kind of into his providential care, And as we get there, you'll understand kind of how that fits in. So we were today. We will mainly be uh, focusing on the on the acts of God being in His creation and in His providential care. So creation, God creates. That's the first thing that He does. He creates, and He call. And when you think of creation, and I I read this one time, and it just it just found a place in my heart, and it's how I think of creation from, this, from that point on. He has called us, he has called creation out of existence, like into existence. So not only does he just, you know, with his word, he says it and it happens, which, you know, we see in scripture. But if you think of it as there, nothing, nothing existed, and the, the trees and the mountains and the larva and the butterflies and the giraffes and you and I have been called out of that, called out of that nothing into our existence. So that's what we need to think of when we think of creation. The fancy word for that that some of you may have heard is ex nihilo. So that means out of nothing. Uh, There are various theories as to how 
that happened. So how did, you know, and that you get into a lot of scientific conversations and assumptions and presuppositions and all of that. We're not really going to get into that <laughs> today, but we are going to, but we do want to emphasize that it is important that creation ex nihilo, so creation out of nothing, did happen. And it's, it is important for us as Christians to believe that. And we will talk, and here's why. The first reason is because that is what, what scripture teaches. And now, some of you who may have a little bit, have read in this area or have thoughts on creation out of nothing, and you get in, like I said, you get into some scientific conversations, it gets really touchy, uh, particularly because, and I want to make it very clear, the original Hebrew and some of even the Greek terms, but especially the original Hebrew terms in the Genesis account, they don't mandate an understanding of creation ex nihilo. So that's where you get a lot of the conversations going on. And, and some people will say, well, it doesn't, you know, maybe there was something already existed or, you know, I, talking about evolutionary um, theology. And we're, again, we're not getting into that, but, and, and some of those people have good answers for this. But generally, um, it's very important that you are aware that the Greek and Hebrew do not mandate the ex nihilo, but it's different so saying that the Genesis account, I'm sorry, I have to be really careful here. Saying that the Genesis account isn't talking about ex nihilo is not the same as saying that God did not create ex nihilo. Does that, does that make sense? What? Say it again. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say <laughs> that um, saying that the Genesis account is not talking necessarily, is not necessarily talking about ex nihilo, does, is not the same as saying that the Bible does not say that God created out of nothing. So even if you were to look at the Old Testament and, and the Genesis account and say, yeah, I recognize that, you know, it might not be necessarily saying that because it might, you know, it says that God was, you know, the, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep and okay well it seems that there might be matter there well you know so does that mean that there wasn't that there was something before God created that's where all of those conversations come in but there are other passages in scripture so regardless of what's going on in Genesis which is super confusing and lots of people have lots of opinions on it there are other passages in scripture that do tell us that regardless of what was happening there God did create out of nothing at some point. So those passages are on your, are on your um, handouts, and that's in Romans 4.17 and Hebrews 11.3. And again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read those. But just so that you know, those are, and several other passages, are what help us know, no, God really did create out of nothing. So it's important for us to believe creation ex nihilo because it's what Scripture teaches, it's also important because it is one of the key things that Christians have believed since the very beginning. I don't know um, how many of you all are familiar with the Nicene Creed, but it is something that Christians back in the 4th century, so 325 AD, Christians came together and said, we kind of need to say specifically what we believe because all of these different heresies, actually largely over Trinitarian issues, all of these different heresies are coming up and we need to say no, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what Christians believe. So in that creed, what they landed on, the very first line is, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. So to be Christian is to believe that God is the creator. All right, so what's at stake? Why am I making such a big deal? <laughs> and why am I being so careful about why? Well, I'm saying certain things the way I'm saying. It's because to think that God used some kind of primordial matter um, either takes us into some really off-the-wall philosophies and religions, especially when you're, you get into the early church history and that kind of thing. Um, and it ultimately, to me, it ultimately questions actually whether God is the creator. So you know, it, it's, a, it's a step, it's a logical step to get there. But if, God, if there was some kind of primordial matter that God didn't create or that he did, 
But then if I'm not saying that, then who really created it? Where did it come from? And, and it just gets kind of messy. So that's why I really believe that creation ex nihilo is actually a very important doctrine that we need to hold to. Um, the other concern that I have about questions about that is to assert that he is not the ultimate creator gets into concern over his sovereignty. Because if he didn't create it, we're about to talk about the implications of him being a creator. If he didn't create it, then he's not in charge of it. Then he doesn't have intricate sovereignty, intricate power, intricate agency over that creation. And so we definitely don't want to go there as Christians either, because that very much goes against what Christians have historically believed. So the implications of what it means to have a creator is that he is the king of it all. That's the Isaiah 37, 16 passage that you have there. He made it, he gets to rule it. <laughs> That's, and when you get into ancient Near East, um, ancient Near East, which is the uh, fancy term for the time when uh, Genesis and all of those types of documents were written, when you get into those, into that cultural theology, the idea is that God, that there was creation um, and that like the king would make something and he would like, he would create and then he, you know, set the people and set uh, vice regents, essentially his vice regents out there um, to serve and to point back to him. And so that's, that's what we have in mind when we're talking about creation. So he's the king of it all. Like I said just a second ago, he is sovereign over it all. So not only is he the king, and it's his kingdom, and it's his reign, he has complete power and control over it. That's the first Samuel 2, 6 through 8 passage. If he is the creator of everything, then we are witness to a God with immense power. And so we can recognize him as a God of immense power power because he did this through a word and you know I mean it takes me like 45 minutes to make a handmade valentine or something you know <laughs> that's just amazing what he did so it demonstrates his immense what yeah it is I'm sorry man um <laughs> and then finally the implication is, another implication is that creation is good if God created it, God is the standard of what is good. He is good. And so if he created it, then the physical world and the physical things around us and your body, they are good. And sometimes in the history of the church and even currently, there's this, um, there's this dualism and there's good and bad things in that. But if we think of ourselves as being composed of both body and spirit, oftentimes we have overemphasized the spirit. And the spirit world is what matters. And our spiritual life is what matters. And, and yes, they, they very much do. But the physical also very much matters. Jesus Christ came to this earth, incarnated into flesh, and lived a life and died and was buried and was resurrected into a fleshly body so that we could have a, an eternal dwelling with the Father from Revelation 21 when the city comes down, physically dwelling. The physical world matters to God, and it is good. So that's the other implication. All right, real quick, because it took me longer. Um, are there any questions about creation, or we're going to move on to providence? Any questions? That is either good or very bad. All right. So the second uh, act of God is God's providential care. So he providentially cares for his creation, and he guides it towards uh, hit the fulfillment of his will, towards its telos, which is the fancy word again. Um, now, this is the idea of providence you may have heard before, and it can mean lots of different things, and we're about to talk about some of the realms that you talk about with providence. But it's a theological term. If you look for the term, the Greek term is proneo, but if you look for that in the Bible, you will not find it. You will find it in 
extra biblical literature of that time. So it's a concept even during the New Testament, but you won't find it in the Bible. So it's a theological concept where, and that means that Christians look at the way God is acting in lots of different ways through in scripture and how he has revealed himself. And we say, you know, there's this, there's this like concept, there's this idea of what he's doing in all of these different ways. And so that's how we get to the theological term providence. So those different ways, the big categories of the different ways, uh, there are typically, there are several different ways of thinking about it, but um, I'm going to present four different spheres of providence, providential care that God has over us that we see in scripture and in life. The first uh, sphere is upholding. So uh, he upholds all of creation. And this is the literal preservation and atomic maintenance of reality. So by that, I mean you are held together by atoms. You know, some of you might be scientists and you know way more about it than that because that's literally all I can say. But, <laughs> but we know that, you know, there, it, when they've talked about, I believe, you know, scientific theory and stuff, like you get down to a certain point and scientists can't even really explain why everything fully holds together, why it exists. I'm not necessarily saying that's God because I think, you know, we might have some other scientific discovery later on, but I think that is the idea that I have here of, like, this exists, I exist, the world exists, it hasn't dissolved or anything like that. God is upholding his creation. And that it, you see in Hebrews 1.3. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That's Jesus. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. The second sphere of God's providence is sustenance. So this is the establishing and maintenance of the natural processes of, like, of reality. So here we have in mind the, the placement of the earth with the moon and the sun. You know, everybody talk, or the placement of the earth on its axis that, you know, I'm sure you've heard if the earth would be, you know, half a degree either way, we would all die. You know, God has set the world in a way that all of it, that there is life and that life not only continues to exist and is upheld, but it, it's provided for. There's a constant water cycle, you know, and it, um, the verse here is Mark 5, 45, the rain falls on the just and the unjust and our... Our, um, our world has the, the mechanism of food automatically growing. You know, there are foods out there and wild foods that we can eat and we have agricultural, you know, and we, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to ag agriculture. But that's the, the establishment and the maintenance of natural processes is God sustaining his creation. The third sphere of God's providence is concurrence. Okay, so this means that the, it's the manner that God works alongside mankind. This does not mean that God needs man. This just means God chooses to take care of and use people to fulfill his purpose and to take care of his creation. And here... Um, he, I, I'm going to suggest he does this in a couple ways. I think it's, there's probably more than two. But the clearest one is through your daily work. And this is where, you know, I, I think we've talked about a little bit the importance of faith and work conversations. But think about how, like, well, yeah, think about how many of you have jobs. And think about how God either restrains sin or how he provides for people through what you do. So if you think of, my boss always has this example, if you think of like a, a box of Wheaties, think about all of the different things that have to happen and all of the different people who have to work to, for you to have a bowl of Wheaties in the morning. You have to have the people who make and produce and transport all the cardboard. You have to have the farmers who plant and harvest and, and all of the transport for all of the grain. You have to have the people who do the recipes, you have to have the manufacturing, you have to have the accountants who, under, <laughs> who work all of the, in, in all the logistics of the infrastructure of all that. God uses what you do to provide for his creation. 
And if you work in medicine or law or law enforcement or um, one other one, uh, maintenance, like even people who clean restrooms and clean these buildings, they're restraining sin. You're holding back disease and illness. You're holding back wickedness with the law and with the government. You're holding back the natural degradation of society and, um, and just like cleanliness with maintenance. What you do matters, and it is part of how God provides for his creation. And finally, he also, um, through concurrence, he also works alongside some individuals, though this is harder to recognize. He works along some in, alongside some individuals for the accomplishment of his salvation story. And so we don't really know. You, you don't, you're not going to know if that's one of you. <laughs> but, you know, Esther is a good example of that. Uh, Cyrus the king who God used to move his heart to let the Israelites return to um, the land, to their land, he was used in God's salvation story. So we see that. So God works through our daily work, and he also works through individuals and in concurrence. The final one, and then I will stop, my love. Um, the final one is governance. So, and this is God guiding creation towards its ultimate um, toward the ultimate fulfillment of God's will. And here we'd also, we would include redemption. Redemption is a part of that because we believe that redemption is a part of God's ultimate, you know, will for creation. And um, you're, you have several passages there that talk about that. And, and here you have not just the movement of history, which, you know, makes sense, but you also have God's work in the particular details of all of our life and our human affairs. And God is working all of these things for his glory, you know, and working all of it for the fulfillment of his will. So provident, providential care is upholding, sustaining, working concurrently with mankind, and governing all of the particular details and the flow of history. So those are two of the ways that God works and, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So that, thank you for bringing that up. So that gets into the uh, Trinitarian presupposition <laughs> that I was talking about. Um, I, I believe, please correct me. I believe the, the phrase is, or if anybody else knows, um, God creates and God redeems, and I would probably even maybe agree with myself, God providentially cares, uh, through the Son, by the Spirit. That's kind of a, a, that's like an important Trinitarian, is that right? Yeah. Um, that's an important Trinitarian formula. So that's how, when God is doing something, he, he God the Father is the one who is doing it. The Son is the one through whom he does it, and the Spirit is the agent who, who does it. So, yes, that was specifically speaking about Jesus in that context, but we do that because we, we look at it. You have to kind of use all of it <laughs> to really make sense of it. Any other questions? Her question was about the upholding passage. It said that it was Jesus who upholds the, uh, the earth by the word of his power, or upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so she was saying, we're talking about God the Father, but that was Jesus, so that doesn't make sense. Oh, sorry. Yes, I will. Yes. She was just asking what her question was. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. So her question is, Elohim, and even it says, let us create, um, at, at least with regard to uh, people, um, mankind, uh, that Elohim is a plural term, 
And that is also one of the Hebrew terms for God. And she's saying that's plural. How is this only God the Father? You know, I, I'm saying that God the Father is the creator. And so once again, that that gets to, there's, there's a lot of, do you want to take it? Yeah, go for it. Um, so <laughs> He's also trying to get the... Yeah, get the front. This is my, this is my subtle That's power play to get the power play. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, this is a, a, every single uh, person of the Trinity is involved in everything that Kim was describing, okay? So it's not just God the Father. So when we sit here and talk about God the Father, the, the way that we described it before we started was what we call theology proper, which is this is kind of your opportunity to talk about what God does as the Godhead. There are some specific things that the Father does. For instance, he sends the Son, right? Uh, the Spirit of God, uh, the Spirit and, and uh, proceeds from, uh, from God the Father and God the Son. He eternally begets, that's a special term, but he eternally begets the Son. So there are some things that the Father specifically does, but today what we're doing is we're talking about what God does as we talk about God the Father, and then next week we'll get into like specifically this is what the Son does underneath that umbrella, this is what specifically the Spirit does underneath that umbrella, and then when we get into the, the heresies and stuff in the last week, this is how it all works together. Does that make sense? Because I can understand how that's, that's, yeah. that's confusing, because when we were sitting here talking about God the Father, I was like, okay, so what are we going to talk about? And she's like, oh, it's theology proper, and I'm like, okay, I got it, like I can do this. So, uh, any other questions? And you're happy to welcome to field them. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's talk about what God is like. And anybody want to, like, when you're talking about a friend that you have, and they're like, oh, what's, what's that person like? Or what's that, you usually say what kind of things about them. What do, you, what do you say about somebody when you're like, oh, they're like this? Caring. Yes. People describe me that way. Yes, all the time. What else? What's that? Good, yeah. Are we talking about good things? Yeah, yeah. So they're like, ah, oh, they're like so and so. They're like, they play like that, or they do like that. Yeah. Holy, yeah. That's a holy person right there. I, nobody describes me that way, but maybe one day. Merciful, yeah, yeah. Honest, yeah. We talk about people being funny, right? Engaging, charming, handsome. I'm just talking about myself. Um, humble. humble. Hey, ouch. <coughs> Shots fired. All right. Woo. I consider myself rebuked. Thank you. All right. So when we talk about God, it's not like that. When we say, what is God like? We don't talk about him in that way. We talk about him in, in, the, in the kind of qualities, the characteristics that he has. So the first one is called aseity, right? Am I saying that right? All right. Aseity. A say, does anybody know what that means? God doesn't need anything from anyone at all. God needs nothing. The only thing God needs is himself. Now, he loves us, but he doesn't need us. He loves his creation. He doesn't need it, okay? He's entirely self-existent. He doesn't depend on anything, so you can't starve God out, you can't wait God out, you can't deprive God of water, he doesn't need any of it, okay? Now, some people, myself included, would say that God is independent of influences outside of anything beyond himself. Now, you're getting into a little bit about prayer there, which is interesting, um, but I would say that God makes his own decisions, and he has the power to make those decisions happen. Okay, so I think prayer is effective, so don't hear me on that. But I can't manipulate God into doing what I want. So like, hey, God, I promise that I'm going to give my next paycheck to the church if you'll do this for me. Like, I didn't work with God. God can't be manipulated like that, okay? It's always in accord with his plan and his purpose, okay? So that's a saity. He does everything on his own. And you see the passage there uh, that you can go to. I'm not going to read those off unless I feel they're particularly pertinent. God is infinite, all right, so what does that mean, infinite? No bounds, limitless, yes, God is not constrained by limits. Now, the way we think of infinity is a spatial kind of idea, right? So, like, if this room was infinite space, you would just be able to go on and on and on forever. Don't think of God's infinity that way. 
Think of it more in quality. So like holiness is infinite. You can't measure it. His goodness is infinite. You can't measure it. His love is infinite. You can't measure it. Those kinds of things. It's a qualitative sort of infinity. And he's also beyond understanding. So Kim said when, when we started, God has revealed some things to us, not everything to us. That's correct. We couldn't handle it. God is infinite. You can't cram infinity in your brain. So when we die and we are raised to live in a new heaven and a new earth as believers, people tend to think, oh, we'll understand everything then. You won't. You think like, oh, like when we, when we die, we're going we're gonna to know everything and we're going to be bored. No, 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 no. God is infinite. Eternity will be an infinite discovery of God's greatness and goodness. It will be anything but boring. It will be thrilling, and it will go on forever because God is infinite. <clears throat> All right, God is omnipresent. Now, what does this mean? He's everywhere. Yeah, okay, so cool. That gets us into some questions, though. Does that mean, like, I'm pushing God, like, right now? Does that mean that, like, God's in the wood here? Shouldn't have done that, sorry. <laughs> what does that mean? Is he everywhere? Like, I'm breathing in God right now? No, no. That was more of a pantheism kind of idea, right? God's in everything. God's, God's a part of everything. We're God too. Like that's, that's a pantheistic idea that's not, uh, that's not right. Um, one of the things that I've always said, uh, or that I've heard said and I like it, is that God is able to bring his power to bear on any location at any time that he chooses. So like this idea that he holds creation all together that is, that is God's omnipresence because he can hold uh, 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 Tajikistan together while also holding me together, while also holding you together, while also holding the tacos I'm probably having for lunch together, which is impressive because they're so full I can't even hold them together. God is not physically present in our universe, okay? He's a spirit being. God the Father is spirit. Um, He's ontologically present. He's not present in things. And that also means that sometimes God manifests himself uniquely in certain situations. So like people are like, oh, I felt the spirit of God move. That doesn't mean that the spirit of God wasn't there before. What it means is perhaps the intensity of the experience, the intensity of God's presence. Again, God's a revealing God. Maybe he made himself known in that space, right? So you have Isaiah chapter 6 where God really makes himself known. You have the incarnation where God really makes himself known. You have Pentecost where people feel it. But then you have th something like a worship service here at the church when you might hear a song or a sermon happens and you're like, oh, I really felt God's presence. You're probably not having a vision, but it's, 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 it's a degree of God's uh, presence. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, eternity. Let's talk about eternity. Uh, a lot of different ideas about God being eternal, um, and, and they usually revolve around the idea of time. So I'm going to tell you what I hold and then what I think Kim holds. Uh, God is eternal, which means he has no beginning and no end, which is hard for us to get our minds around why. We're not eternal. So what does this tell you about God's eternal nature? It tells you that God created time and then shoved everything else into it. So God does not think, we think about time in a, in a linear sense, right? You know, I, I started here, I did this yesterday, I'm doing this today, and then tomorrow I'm gonna do this. God doesn't work like that. God operates outside of time. Uh, there's a whole lot of discussion as to what that means. There's some people that think that God does operate in, uh, God does operate in time, but some people think God is constrained by time. I do not. I think that violates the eternality of God. Um, but God does not have a beginning. He does not have an end. Now, we are eternal in that whether you are a believer or not, you will exist forever. But we do not ha we have a beginning. We have a starting point in time. God does not. So, any questions on eternality of God? Okay. God is immutable. Does anybody know what immutability is? It means you can't keep God quiet. No, that's not what it means. It means that God doesn't change. 
Now, people struggle with this. You'll hear uh, there's, a, there's a fairly recent group of theologians called process theologians. This idea that God learns, God develops, God grows, that kind of violates the immutability principle. So uh, I hold and, and, and Kim holds to an immutability, which means God doesn't uh, change. And you see it uh, there in Micah 3.6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, this doesn't mean that God is static. Okay, it it, is hard to, God is a dynamic God. God does things. Um, He's not static, but God's character and his being do not change. So the things I'm telling you about God today were true yesterday, were true uh, centuries before, were true from the beginning of all things, and they will be true until the end of all things. God does not change who he is. God's not going to wake up one day and all of a sudden be like, you know what? I'm kind of tired of being a good God. Let's get a haircut. Let's be a rebel God for a while. It's not how God works. He's immutable. He doesn't change. He does not grow. He does not mature. He does not develop. He does not learn. Okay? He's immutable. Now, there are some things in which God's knowledge changes. For example, God knows that yesterday was yesterday, or God knows that yesterday was then today. And then when the clock rolls over, God knows that it's today. So his knowledge has changed, but it's not that his knowledge has grown or decreased, right? Does that make sense? Like things have changed for him, so he, he knows it's changed? Cool. Omnipotence. What does omnipotence mean? He's all powerful, right? He can do anything, right? Uh, Does does anybody know, there's not really a word for omnipotence in scripture. The closest you get for it is almighty. So when you see God almighty, that is the the writer, usually the psalmist is crying out to God on behalf of his power. So uh, God is, is almighty. Some say that he can do anything. Some say that his power is finite. Some people would make arguments like God can do anything as long as it's logical. So the, can God make a stone so big he can't lift it? That's not logical. So no, because it doesn't make sense. I would say that God does have some limits on his omnipotence. They are self-imposed. So for instance, God cannot sin. It is something he cannot do. So God can't lie. God can't break a promise. God can't abuse us. God cannot uh, decide all of a sudden that Jesus' sacrifice was good today, but it's not going to be good enough tomorrow. God can't do that because he's promised it. So he's going to stick to it. Um, God cannot die. Again, Jesus is a a different case. We'll get into that next week. Uh, God cannot commit suicide. So God can't will himself out of existence. God also cannot make a God of equal strength and power. He can't make another God. Okay, so in in that regard, God does not reproduce. All right, Kim, um, God can and does, so his power usually revolves around this. God can and does save, forgive, rescue, create. And as Kim talked about, his power, largely what we experience is in creation, sustaining, and redemption. That's really usually how we experience his power, some version of that. Uh, We've got a section on sovereignty. I'm going to skip that for the sake of time and the fact that Kim covered sovereignty quite well. Uh, Omniscience. What does this mean? He knows everything, right? He knows everything. God knows everything. Everything that's happened, everything that is happening, everything that will happen. Now then, I'm about to go, I'm about to cross a line for some people. Some people think God only knows what is and what will happen, what has happened. Anything that could happen, they would say that God doesn't know. I would say God knows everything that could happen, everything that couldn't happen, everything true, everything false, everything in between, God knows. Everything. God knows. He's aware of it, and he plans accordingly. He's aware. He knows everything. The deepest parts of our heart that we don't even know, if some of us are sitting here with with a virus or a cold, why it hasn't manifested itself yet, guess what? He knows it's there, right? He knows all that stuff. Wisdom. Uh, Job 9.4. Let's talk about wisdom real quick because this is important. 
He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. Job is in the middle of, of the worst day ever, and he's like, you know what? Like, I want to kind of challenge God, but at the same time, he's, he knows what he's doing. So we, we've talked about God being all-powerful. We're talking about God being all-knowing. That doesn't make you a good God. That very easily can make you a tyrant and awful and abusive and terrible. God's wisdom means that he knows how to take what he knows and to take what he can do and use it for our good and his glory. That's what his wisdom is. He takes those, those characteristics that we applaud so much so often and he uses it for our benefit, right? He leverages it toward the right decision, right? Oftentimes when we question God's goodness, like why would God let this happen to me? You're actually questioning his w wisdom. You're not questioning necessarily his goodness. It's his wisdom. Uh, unity, uh, God is one, he's singular, and he is one in that he is unique, okay? So there's only one God, not a big surprise. Uh, only one God has been revealed to us. Now, there may be other gods, per se, but they are false gods. They're not really uh, gods, right? So, anyway. Simplicity. Uh, this one I've always found, I think, to be the hardest one to get my head around. Uh, God is not a composite of many things. Uh, he's not the sum of his parts. He's not divided. So, you don't like, the best way I can describe it, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, like when you bake a cake, a cake is a sum total of eggs and flour and sugar and other delicious things that I don't understand because I don't bake. But that's what a cake is. God isn't like a dash of holiness and a sprinkle of righteousness, and, and that's not how he works. He is. He is a unified whole uh, together, right? Um, he's not divided. He can't be divided into parts. Okay, so that's what God is like. Any questions about what God is like? We're almost done. We're hitting the home stretch. Any questions? All right. Let's talk about who God is. Who God is. He is holy. Now, uh, we preached a couple, a few weeks ago on God's holiness at the beginning of this series on uh, prayer. I would encourage you, if you want to deep dive into that, go back and listen to the sermons there. It's, it's, it's a good uh, discussion on holiness. Uh, but God is essentially distinct and separate. He's unlike anything else. That's what holiness is. He's also perfect. So he's the most his characteristics can be in quality of what he is. And he's morally perfect. Again, God cannot sin, cannot be tempted, and he abides by his own rules. Okay? That's important to, to remember. God does not take his own name in vain. Stuff like that. God follows his own commands. God is righteous. Everything God does is morally right. And everything he does is fair. He says what he will do, and he will do it. He lays down his own rules, and he enforces them, okay? So that's important, too, because you talk about, oh, well, why can't, why can't uh, God just forget about the fact that we've sinned? Like, why can't he just, you know, just let it go? Because that would violate his righteousness. He, he can't do that. That would violate his character. Again, another limit on his power. God is love. We talk about this a lot. God feels for us. He cares for us. The Bible is chocked full of God's love. It goes above and beyond trying to show us that despite of God's perfections, he desires to be near us. It's this thing, when you begin to understand who God is, and you, you read all these things, you're like, why would God want to hang out with me? It's like, it's like me being like, I want to go hang out with a bunch of 12-year-olds all the time. That just sounds super fun. There's a gap in maturity there, and also kind of creepy. <laughs> why would God want to hang out with something like me? And the Bible goes above and beyond making you know for a fact. Because it's so easy for us to question, does God really love us? Yes, he does so, 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 so much. He adores us. He adores you. May I say something? Yes, please say something. <clears throat> and just that, that love and the overflowing love um, within the Trinity because of its own aseity, its own self-sufficiency. Most people believe that that is why God created the world and, and why he created us is out of the overflowing love that he wanted others, he wanted something else, he wanted a creation to partake in that love. 
Yeah. Father says to the son, hey, this is pretty cool. Let's bring some other people into this party. Holy Spirit's like, yeah, okay, I'm down. Let's do this. So then there was hovering of waters and stuff like that. God is gracious. What is grace? Anybody know what grace is? How would you describe grace? It's my daughter's middle name. What else? Does it make sense? Oh, the question? Like, how would you describe grace? Grace doesn't make sense. Okay. Good. Yeah. I was teasing you. Okay. Thank you, TJ. Okay. It's acceptance. Yeah. It's good. Undeserved acceptance. That's key. It's unmerited favor. I had a college minister that told me once, grace is just the fact that God really stinking likes you. Like, that's it. Like, he just likes you. Like, you're his favorite along with everyone else. And that's awesome. God likes you for no other reason than he made you and he redeemed you. Um, the most powerful being in the universe has a crush on you. And that's pretty awesome. Um, this means that good things happen to you even when you haven't deserved it. And there is a difference between saving grace, which we experience through a relationship with Christ, and what's called common grace, which is like everybody has air to breathe and the water falls on the, or the rain falls on the wicked and the righteous alike. That's common grace. Uh, rounding into the home stretch here, mercy. Uh, mercy is unmerited favor, like grace, but it's when you've done something to deserve worse. So it's, mercy is like, oh, you broke a, a vase at home, I'm not going to punish you, or it's not going to be as bad as it could have been. That's mercy. God's mercy is extended to us through Christ, and then also through sustaining us. The fact that he didn't obliterate Adam and Eve the moment they took a bite out of that fruit, that's mercy. And then he clothed us, that's grace. God is long-suffering. Uh, if you'll notice here, I've got several Old Testament passages. I went there for a lot of the, like, loving ones because a lot of people think Old Testament God was angry and, and kind of had a chip on his shoulder. New Testament God is cuddly and warm. Um, it's the same God, okay? So God is long-suffering. It means he's patient. He's slow to anger. Uh, he, why is he patient? Anybody know why God's patient with us? He loves us? Yeah. There's a goal in mind, though. Yeah, he's got all day because he made it. It's because he's hoping we'll repent. God is patient because he wants us to grow. He wants us to change. He wants us to stop what we're doing and draw close to him. God is good, which means God is concerned about our well-being and he promotes it. Uh, God has loving kindness, which means that God has genuine love, exercise for his people. And then lastly, God is truthful. We've talked about this. He can't lie. God is truth. Uh, he can't mislead. So think about this. Like, how many of you have thought, like, oh, man, like, everything's going really well. Like, the other shoe's going to drop, and God's, God's going to smack me on the back. He's going to set me right soon. That is misleading you. God can't do that. More than that, God doesn't want to do that. Okay? Um, God makes promises, and he sticks with them. Whew. All right. I really want everybody to appreciate everything that he just did in like 20 minutes. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> um, so what questions do you have for either of us? Yes, sir. Mm. Yeah. So, so as we've described God, the word jealous comes up. Okay. So I would say two things. One, the list is not exhaustive, not at all. And two, jealousy operates out of his love and his loving kindness. The reason why God is jealous for you is because he knows the best place for you to be, the safest place, the place where you're going to grow the most is right next to him. When your affections are turned completely to him, that's the best place for you to be. So that's why he's jealous. So it's love and loving kindness out of that is where I would put his jealousy in the scheme of things that we've talked about today. Did you say we're jealous of God? Or je Okay, jealous. Okay. I know you got this. Fine. Stand up. Come hang out with me. I'm, I'm sitting here. Do you notice how she told me to sit down, but I told her to stand up and like be known? You are empowering. Well <laughs> done. What else? <laughs> oh, Tanner. We have four minutes. No. <laughs> Just because God knows what is happening 
And just because God is sovereign and in control of everything does not mean that he, we are puppets. Um, God did not want to create automatons. There is, there's a whole day that we can spend on this, literally a whole day. People spend entire lives talking about this. Here's what I would say. If God wanted us to just be puppets, Adam and Eve would have never had a problem. So if you, if you want to know about free will, look back to, you know, ancient mom and dad and be like, they clearly had free will to do what they wanted. At the same time, God is sovereignly in control. You can be, uh, you can be the most Calvinistic predestination elect person in the world and still hold to free will. Calvinists don't even hold to any kind of determinism like that, okay? Um, so they, they're, they're wedded somehow, it happens. Um, just like I know that if I put cookies on the table and I don't like keep them away from my children, I know that they will be gone. I may not move the cookies because I want to give my daughters the opportunity to, to, to grow to, to grow. mature. Yes. Any other questions? Comments? Oh, thank you. That was fun. Thank you guys for being here. This was awesome. Yeah. So the last thing we want to do before we leave is we want to talk about this doesn't matter at all to you if it does not change your life. So if there is no, if you walk out of here and you're like, wow, that was really interesting, but it doesn't change the way you interact with your, your spouse, with your friends, with your, with your world, then what are we doing? It doesn't change how you interact with your God. What are we doing? Um, one of my favorite phrases is theology at its best is doxology and doxology is worship. So theology is not worthwhile unless it leads you and it is worship. Um, the person who told me that said theology just teaches you the right notes to play. And that's, um, so we, uh, hopefully in the next couple weeks, uh, we will take time and today, hopefully you can take a little bit of time to just reflect, how does this change? How does, how does this change how I worship? How does this change how I live? Knowing these things about God the Father. For me personally, uh, as I was thinking through those questions, as I was preparing this, I just thought uh, about rest. Like I can just rest because God is powerful. He is in control and he loves me. He doesn't need me. And he ha he's got it all. And for some reason, like he said, God stinking likes me. And so I can, I can rest. So maybe just take a little bit of time uh, this afternoon and just think through, okay, all these different things, all these big fancy words we wrote down. What does it, what does it mean and how can it change how I worship and how can it change how I live with other people? Yeah, and for me, um, have you ever been to the Arboretum, right? I am not a plant person, horticulturist, whatever it is. Uh, I can't like walk through the woods and know like, oh, that's that and that's that. So the Arboretum is really helpful for me because they put these clever little signs down that tell me that this is like a, a Japanese something or, you know, this is, this is an oak. I should know that one, but I don't. <laughs> it's helpful for me. And so when you're wandering through the Arboretum, you're able to appreciate things just a little bit more because you know what they are. You're able to interact with it a little bit more. And so I want you to think about just this week, your relationship with the Lord is almost strolling through a garden, but a garden of theology, a God, garden of God's characteristics, a garden of Eden, sure, why not? And what we've done is we've given you little signposts. So each day, you can reflect on God's qualities and be like, God, I love the fact that you're so uh, self, self-sustaining. I so want to be independent. I so want to not depend on anything. And that is because I want to be you. That's, that's in some ways a confession of sin, so it's a great place to start with confession, but also just to appreciate who he is amazing God thank you so much so this helps you this is a liturgy for you for a week it's something for you to pray through be like God show yourself for who you are and, and so it, it really is just kind of that's a that's a map of a garden of God's qualities for you to enjoy and and, and apply to your daily life okay all right it's high noon. Pray. pray and we'll get out of here father God thank you so much uh, for who you are how amazing it is uh it's amazing who you are, Lord. It's amazing what you do. But for me, and I think for everybody in this room, it's amazing that you've chosen to just make yourself known and that you want to know us and you want to you spend time with us and you want us to pour out our hearts to you, even though you know everything about us. It's pretty amazing. It's more than pretty amazing. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. 
And so, God, I pray that everybody in this room, as our, as our knowledge got a little bigger today, uh, I pray that our hearts have also grown. Our affection for you and affection for others have increased, and we would be grateful for who you are and what you've done. And we love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your son's great name we pray. Amen.